Welcome back to Just Giants with Grump and the Cranky Fan, the best damn podcast for the best damn football team. I am your host, the football grump. With me, as always, is Mike, the Cranky Fan, and it is conference championship weekend, and we have our Super Bowl contenders this year. Yeah, props to the uh, the Cranky Wife, uh, 49ers and Kansas City rematch of, what was it, four years ago? It was the, uh, the last um, pre-COVID Super Bowl, right, when they met? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, pretty, I, I don't know. Uh, one exciting game, one dud of a game, in my opinion. For sure. Uh, uh, all right, so let's let's start with the dud of the game. Chiefs-Ravens. Um, I, in my opinion, this game is mostly the story of Lamar Jackson just not following through. Uh, but also, well, yeah, let's talk a little bit about that. Um Thrown to triple coverage, I don't know what the hell you're thinking. But also, just in general, I, I know he was let down by some drops, but this was a game which, for whatever reason, was mostly on his shoulders to try and win, and he just didn't follow through. Yeah, and it also didn't seem like he was just comfortable the whole game. Like, did, like you know, take off when you could take off. You know, he just was indecisive even to take off. He would be in the pocket for way, way too long. You know, it just... He just didn't seem comfortable the entire game. And I don't know if that's, you know, he shouldn't be having nerves at this point, but just feeling the pressure of everything. But he definitely looked like a quarterback that looks small in the big lights. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, early on he might have been rattled. I mean, it was very early in the game he kind of got hit from behind, uh, fumbled in the pocket. Mm -hmm. It was strip-sacked. Looked kind of like um, – I don't know. Looked like it hurt, honestly. Yeah. Uh, but might have thrown him off his game. Uh, but in general, I think part of that game threw Baltimore off early on. Uh, time of possession was like completely in favor of Kansas City in the first half, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and, and, and I think that I think that created a sense of urgency that really shouldn't have been there because in the second half, when I think Baltimore, I think like. A, a, an offense similar to San Francisco's in that it's predicated on its incredible run game, partly in, you know, due in part to Lamar Jackson's running ability. And the second half, Baltimore Ravens didn't employ that. They they just like completely abandoned the run game in the second half. Yeah, if you remember in last week's show when we were predicting this, I did not have a good feeling about Baltimore at all. Oh, I I was I pick Kansas City to win outright, and I just. I just something about them just, just just didn't seem right. Sem seemed off, and Lamar Jackson played exactly like that in in the game. Where, I mean, and again, it's not like you know Harbaugh's a great coach. You know, where it's not a question of coaching or anything. It was just kind of you're right. You know, when you when you're down and some stats and just the feel of a game feels like it's worse than it actually is. Coaches don't go and do what they do best and teams don't do what they do best. And that certainly felt like that. And, uh, when you don't do what you do best, you're not as good as you are. And that's looked like what would happen. Yeah. And, uh, I know that, uh, it seems like there was a lot of focus on Baltimore having a lot of penalties and being like undisciplined play in that game. And I, I don't know, I don't know how much that really played into the loss. Like they, they highlighted some sloppiness, and I think that that played into it more. But it just felt like I don't know. They they didn't play their game in the second half. Yeah, uh, they they played like a team that was rattled. I mean, some of the things like the personal fouls and some of that stuff that felt like a team that was unraveling a little bit. Yeah, um, I can't stand that Kansas City is going to the Super Bowl, man. I hate Kansas City. I hate. I. I mean, really. I, I. I hate both of those teams. You know. First of all, I'll never root for Kansas City ever for doing the Seminole chop, and so they're automatically out. Uh, I don't. But Baltimore just seems to have been like a punk organization for twenty something years. I mean, again, the fact that they celebrate a murderer as one of their 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 big heroes in that team just tells you all you need to know. Um. I, I, I don't like either team at all. Uh, I don't, never liked Andy Reid going back to the Eagle days. There's just a lot of reasons why. And um, But, you know, I did – like I said, their team wins. And all of a sudden, Andy Reid went from a coach that was kind of like a loser to being a coach that's now just a winner. 
And, um, you know, we'll, we'll get to the other half of the, the, uh, the matchup in a second, but, uh, it's hard to pick against them when, when you have a, a quarterback who just always does the right thing and just knows how to win. Simple as that. Yeah. Um, I, I don't have a problem with Baltimore winning anything. Uh, I don't, I don't hate them. I don't care one way or another about them, but just in general, I just, I, I've hated them back from that Super Bowl loss and even, you know, just, just the way they acted, they act like a bunch of just, I don't know. They always seem to be like a, you know, uh, play to the echo, the, the whistle type of team, you know, and, and obviously the Ray Lewis stuff and I don't know, just never liked them. I've never have liked them. Uh, maybe, maybe because they moved from Cleveland originally, I never liked them and I, I, I screwed the, you know, the city of Cleveland has put the perception on for it. But now we're talking 30 years or something. But they just seem like a team that they read. They to me are the AFC version of New Orleans in, in my head. Just a you know, slightly dirty, slightly you know, playing to the edge of of, of being clean. Just don't like them. Okay. Yeah. I, I I mean I don't I don't care. I I I don't know. I just can't stand the uh, the idea of. Uh, I hate the idea of the same teams being represented in the Super Bowl year after year after year. And, like, I understand, like, a two-, three-year little run tends to happen when teams are good. Uh, but this is this is exactly what I hated about, like, the Tom Brady thing. It was never – I don't well, know. It, it was it, just – it's just so monotonous and frustrating seeing the same faces all the time. Well, think about – you know, when I was growing up in the 90s, you know, and, uh, you know, when I was in college and, and stuff where you could pencil in every single year, Dallas and the 49ers in the NFC championship game, Buffalo in the AFC championship game, and then the, you know, the subsequent Buffalo gets our asses kicked by you name the team in, in, the, in the Super Bowl. So we're get, we're getting to that level almost. But and, but it's more impressive now because, you know, you have the salary cap. You have more things that are trying to create more parity in this league. And yet, you know, you have really good coaches and really good quarterbacks, teams that can control their salary cap. They're just going to keep rising to the top. Um, do you think that Kansas City did anything particularly good in this game? Like, this was a low-scoring game. You know, it didn't really feel like Baltimore did anything great defensively. Uh, you know, it, it's hard to it's hard to say something like that holding Kansas City to only seventeen points, right? But yeah. but it didn't feel like anything fantastic was happening in this game. It just if there was anything of note, it was like Baltimore just screwing up. Yeah, it just, it felt really fast watching the game, like. Oh my yeah. God! It's a two-minute two warning already, and then, you know, when you're when you're the um, you're in, when you're the underdog and you're the away team, the best thing you want to do is you want to shorten a game as much as possible. And all of a sudden, that game was you know it, before you even settled in, it was almost halftime already. So I, I think just you know you just want to survive these games. There's no style points. You're not trying to you know try not trying to Im impress voters or, or playoff committee members or anything. It's just just have one more point with them at the end of the game. And um, they shortened the game and, you know, they, they won. Yeah. Um, I guess I, I think it's more that uh, they, they're they the ones that created uh, – just turned the ball over. I mean, fumbling into the end zone uh, yeah. and, then, and then throwing the interception, throwing into triple coverage. I mean, really, I think that was the difference. You know, 17 to 10 – says that it was like a close bitter game it didn't feel like it at all no, no. um it just no. felt like at no point it felt like at any point the ravens could have like an explosive 80 yard play or something and make it close again but it mm -hmm. didn't feel like they were going to sustain some 16 play drive for a touchdown or anything like that it just it didn't feel like they could get anything going yeah yeah it just at the end of the day it just to me you know Patrick Mahomes felt more comfortable in a big game than Lamar Jackson did. I think it, it might be something as simple as that. You know, and when you're two teams that are pretty close to each other, you know, they were, you know, they're the, I think that the, the two best teams in the AFC, you know, it, it comes down to something is a small of a margin of just 
who's a better quarterback. And right now, you know, uh, Lamar Jackson will probably win the MVP, but who do you want in a big spot? Who do you want in one game? I'm not sure how many people outside of, you know, the DMV is going to who's going to pick uh, Lamar Jackson. Yeah. Um, flipping over to the NFC Championship game, the night game, a tale of two halves indeed. This was a game. <laughs> yeah, this one was fun. Um, Detroit coming out swinging, uh, could not be stopped, ground or air, um, and then couldn't keep it together in the second half. Yeah. Just I, totally just totally flipped around. It, it looked like a tale of a first half of one team. It didn't look like they watched any film of the other team. I mean, it, it just – it seemed like everything that um, the Lions were doing was something that San Francisco had never seen before. And it was just – you know, play schematics, play execution. Guys were wide open everywhere. They ran at will. It just was like, you know, this was it was very surprising from a you know, from a, from a Shanahan team. And then, I think the second half, what happens? I I just think that Dan Campbell arrogance, which people have been kissing his ass for being such a, you know, go for a guy. You know, I think that that's what bit him in this game. And I know I, I'm sure you want to have your comments on this too. But to me, there's a difference between. Well, the analytics say, and being arrogant. And to me, this was absolutely a, a, a game where Dan Campbell was arrogant and inconsistent in what he was doing. And I think that that cost him the, this game. I don't have a strong opinion. I, I don't think there was anything wrong with where he went for it and how he did it. But I never, I never have a strong opinion about these things. Uh, and the reason why is that he, here's, here's where my strongest opinions come from. Um, what the Bills did. If you're going to go for it on anything more than fourth and one, do not put your special teams unit out there to go for it. I don't care how clever your fake is. Put your best players in the best position to make the yards you need to make. Mm-hmm. Don't run a fake like that in that scenario. For As long as you've decided, if you're comfortable in what you've got to make right there and as long as the place on the field makes sense i'm pretty much okay with it so uh i i don't have a strong opinion saying that he shouldn't have done it there well my, well th- there was there's a few things where you know twice they went for it on fourth down uh where you could you could make it a three score game right there's no reason to, i know a lot of people are like well go for the kill shot go for the head point. yeah if it works great but i'm always gonna be a well what if they don't make it and to me, you kick the field goal, you get three. You have a, a San Francisco team that was sputtering an offense. You tell them in the second half, go score three times. Now they might, but again, coaching to me is very simple. Put your team in the best situation, in the best position to succeed. And, you know, you kick a field goal, you're up three scores. You just made it a lot harder for that team to try to come back and win. And then also, if you're Mr. Aggressive, Mr. Go for it, at the end of the game, why not go for two with that last touchdown? That way, you know, you're trying, like I said just before, you want to shorten a game, especially if you're on the road, especially if you're a, you know, an, an underdog. Go for two. You know, that way you make it, you know, a, a field goal potentially, you can win the game. So that inconsistency about, well, he's always aggressive, he's always aggressive. Well, he is until he isn't. And then when you start being inconsistent, then you're not such a genius. Then to me, you're just going back on gut, and everybody has a gut, and everybody's gut is never always right. So I would give him a fart for that just for the uh, the arrogance and then just kind of flip-flopping on his philosophy. I don't think that's flip-flopping at all because – what. I don't think it's intelligent to go for two in that scenario at all. That makes no sense. Because if you don't get it, now you can't kick a field goal to tie the game. Now you've got to score. Yeah, but, you're, but your your philosophy throughout the whole game and the whole season is I'm Mr. Aggressive. I go for it. But, that, go for but it. going for it, yeah, you go for it when it makes sense. That doesn't and make then, any sense. But then you're proving my other point for the rest of the game, though. Those other things, going for it in those situations when, you know, you kick that field goal and you're up three. Both times when he when he when he went for it and didn't get it. What was the time? Pretty- give me the give me the times and situations. 
They the first one was kind of middleish third quarter. They're up by fourteen, and it was fourth and two, fourth and three, and they went for it. When if he kicks the field goal, they'd be up three scores. Yeah, that was twenty minutes from the end of the game. You are now at the end of the game where only the next couple of plays matter. You have so much time to deal with the repercussions of that marginal decision that can be a kind of a flip of a coin. I, I'm not saying, and I'm not going to defend that. What I'm saying is there is no comparison whatsoever that you are trying to draw a line here between something that happens the middle of the third quarter that's kind of defendable versus going Ultra aggressive, 100%. We are going to get these two points. Then I'm going to recover an onside kick. Then I'm going to gain a couple of yards, well, kick a field goal, the, win the, the game. Kick stuff is irrelevant because you need to go onside kick regardless. It's yeah, I I understand that's not that part what of the argument. no, it's part of it because that's how many things in a row that you say that you are going to do when you say that. That is so hyper aggressive. That is not even close to the same level of aggressive that you're comparing it to. That, to me, is the biggest stretch. Well, I can't believe that you're even making that face. I don't see yeah, the... I don't I, I, I don't see the upside to going for two there. Because if you miss it, you are now... You have just fucked yourself out of the game. Well, totally again, totally again, fucked yourself your point, out. Though, again, so many things had to happen anyway. I mean, you had to get no, on psychic, which... All, all, mm -hmm. it, it, why would you stack one more on there? That, that is literally, you're not only stacking one more, you're stacking a literal linchpin into it. It makes no sense. I don't want to go to overtime, especially on the road. I want to win the game. You, you, but you, that is not really a situation. Like, that's, I, I agree with that sentence when your choices are, if I go for two, this gives me an opportunity to win, but I'll still have to, you know, score a touchdown anyway or whatever. It, that's like a picking a plan A or plan B thing. You, you're picking a, I'm going completely balls to the wall, 100% all in, pushing all of my chips to the middle of the table on this two-point conversion. It makes no sense to me. That is so hyper-aggressive. And, and, and you're saying that it's inconsistent with going for it in the middle of the third quarter. That's the, the stretch. Who, the, the, the guy who's... He's putting his whole reputation on, I'm Mr. Aggressive. We go for it. That's what we do. This is Lions football. I mean, the guy, he's almost becoming a cartoon character about talking about himself or stuff like that. That would be the dumbest. He would be destroyed for that decision. Just throwing that out there. I, I think, I, I, and I'm, again, I'm not defending any of his decisions earlier on. Uh, just saying that they are defensible. That would be indefensible, in my opinion. Going yeah. forward to there. All right. Um... Other curious things from this game. Uh, I think the, the, the key to this game for me with throwing Detroit off offensively is getting Jared Goff off of his spot. Like what you could see, like once he has to get outside the pocket, his accuracy and his ability to read the field just kind of falls to pieces. And he's not really a super athlete running away from guys like, you know, especially guys like Nick Bosa. You know what I mean? Right, right. See, I was thinking about actually Purdy a little bit more because we had had a conversation. Was it before the last show or, or you know, this past we week we, about, we discussed it on the last episode. We did, we discussed the last one. Okay. We, we were pretty much saying we need to see Purdy in a big moment. Right, right. And, you know, he stepped up in the second half for, for sure. But that first half, he was very shaky again. Uh, you know, he had, he had, what, two, three balls batted at the line of scrimmage. He was missing some passes. Are you still confident in him as a franchise quarterback on this team? Because, granted, he's got a lot around him. He's got, you know, he's got one a top three running back. He's got a, a, a great tight end, which for some reason they never throw to in Kittle. Uh, you know, he's got Ayuk. He's got, you know, Debo. He's got, you know, all these weapons, a good offensive line and stuff. But – you know, at some point, you know, the salary cap's going to play into this team and they're going to lose some of these weapons and stuff without, you know, a perfect cast of characters around him. Is he still your guy? No, that's sort of that's sort of the point that I was making is, uh, you know, when, when I think of the success of the San Francisco 49ers, you know, or, or sorry, when I think of the success of um, 
So the Cincinnati Bengals, I think of it all really hinging on Joe Burrow. When I think of the Chiefs, I think of it mostly being Patrick Mahomes, but, you know, a lot of Andy Reid influence. When I think of the 49ers, I think of mostly Shanahan and then some McCaffrey, right? Uh, I think that's really the identity, is that it's Shanahan's team, Shanahan's offense. Um, yep. I, that's the franchise to me. Uh, so... I, I'm saying that it might be financially more sound and more in the philosophy to, uh, you know, I'm, I was I was just kind of like opining. It was it was like a hypothetical. Uh, was it more financially sound to then cycle in? I don't know what you'd call them, but like second rate quarterbacks um, that were just capable commanders of an offense. Mm-hmm. Um, that were able to make timing throws, make smart decisions on the field, protect the football, you know, be accurate. Yeah, uh, be, be be smart decisions and accuracy. Be be, be a responsible games. and consistent quarterback mm-hmm. in, in command of an offense. Uh, you know, you know, having all the intangibles, just not expected to make things out of nothing. Not expected to put the entire game on their shoulders because the right. entire game is on the coach's shoulders. Uh, but the one thing we keep forgetting, though, about Purdy is this is his second year, right? Yes. I believe I mean, that's right. He's still pretty young. I mean, how many career starts has he had? Not many. Not no, many. no, no. It's certainly early. And you have a whole other year to make the decision. I was postulating from, you know, a, a, a two point standpoint, right? Like, soon San Francisco needs to make this decision at the same time that the heavy criticism on this one quarterback prospect is that he is so heavily um, aided by the run game system that he comes from. Mm-hmm. Um, you know what I mean? Like, I saw a match that was happening there. You saw the there. fit. You saw the fit. That you have a whole other year to make your analysis on Brock Purdy. So, but, but no, I'm not sold on absolutely anything. Yeah, I agree. I mean, you're right. It's uh, so the, the, w- your your thought process is more on that specific JJ McCarthy as opposed to get the next guy in here. Re- you know, regard if we have the opportunity to get somebody. Yeah, I, I mean, my my thought was, you know, if if for whatever reason this draft prospect falls so far that you find yourself in an Aaron Rodgers type situation, or mm-hmm. you know, that's that's an extreme thing. But you know what I'm saying, like. Is this the move that you make? Is that the smart decision? Or do you wait another year to see with Purdy? And then, you know, he's going to command money, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, it went in two years, right? He doesn't get the fifth year. It's after the fourth year. Correct. correct. Yeah. So it's after next year. And then even if for some reason you decide you want to franchise him and all that stuff, that's still going to be big bucks. It so. would be the top five salary, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you have to make a financial decision on Brock Purdy after next year anyway. And it is kind of an interesting scenario. So Sure. I mean, hey, he's one game away from being a Super Bowl champ. <laughs> I love the story. I want it to work with him. It would yeah. be cool as hell. I think it's the coolest thing ever for a Mr. Irrelevant to become the franchise quarterback there, get some five-year deal worth all this stuff, and succeed. Like, not just get that deal, but, like, continue to succeed there. We're excited because we have a Mr. Irrelevant who is on the field and is like, oh, he contributes. Mr. Irrelevant, that's great. This is a guy who's probably going to end up in the top three in, in the MVP voting and is a game away from winning a Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that has to be you – know, but then, you know, I know it's kind of like lightning in a, in a bottle type of thing, but, you know, if they decide to draft a McCarthy anyway, you know, that organization is so smart and so savvy that, you know, it's not just for, well, he's the heir apparent. It's there's an asset that could be. And I think this is one of the points you made last week also was an asset. That we could certainly if we need to put on the block for other assets is definitely something to have in our, you know, in our war chest. Yeah, that that was kind of my my thing was the worst case scenario. I get. Well, I guess the worst case scenario is that JJ McCarthy doesn't pan out and Brock Purdy isn't the guy, and now you're stuck with two sunk costs. But I, I guess that seems incredibly pessimistic. But even if they both pan out, now you have something that you can trade into assets, whichever yeah. one that you favor less or commands more on the market or whatever. I, I would say you know. As far as Purdy, though, is again, he's got another at least another year. We get to see what he can do, you know, after this year. Then there'll be the fourth year, and then they make their decision. So I, it's a decision on that for him. They don't have to make that decision just yet. But you know, 
a smart GM, you know, and Lynch is a very smart GM. It's a very smart organization. I'm sure they're, I'm sure they're thinking about it. I, I would, I would hope so. I'm sure they are, but, yeah. um, couple of things. How do we feel about the, well, yeah. Okay. How do we feel about the Super Bowl here? Niners chiefs early on here. Uh, we still have two weeks till it happens. Um, any initial thoughts? Um, if you if I can be like in a bubble for the next two weeks, not hear any of the hype and the noise surrounding the game, I'd be in a much happier place. I don't want to hear one word about you know girlfriends and stuff. Um, I think it's great. I, I think this is a you know we were trying to guess the line what it would be right after the game was over, and I was on a text thread with four people, and three of them thought the line would be even. And it's actually, do you know what it is? I do not know. It is San Francisco by one and a half. Okay. Which is, you know, I would have believed Kansas City by two. I would have believed San Francisco by two. Um, it's going to you know, move. It, it's. I think it's definitely. I think it's going to move towards Kansas City. To be honest, I, I think uh, when you have two teams that are, I think San Francisco is a better overall team, but. Having the better coach, <laughs> maybe you know, and the better quarterback, that combination of the two in a one-game scenario, I don't know. I, I I really don't know who I'm gonna pick in this game yet, and it's it's I need to think about it a lot. But uh, the fact I don't know makes it exciting for me as a game. Yeah, gonna agree. Uh, I would really like for San Francisco to win this. I love the Brock Purdy story. I like Kyle mm-hmm. Shanahan as a coach. I like Christian McCaffrey. I like the team. Um, I love the pair of linebackers. Um, I, I I just don't like the San Francisco organization. It's just to me the Cowboys of the West. The San uh, Francisco organization. Yeah, just as the the team in general, they're just the Cowboys of the West to me. Um, in what way? Uh, fan base. A lot of the oh. fan base. Oh, see, I think it's different. I think that the the Cowboy fan base is you know. Again, first of all, it's it's national in, in scope, but it's much more of a, you know, I it's like a bully mentality. It's the kind of like, look at me. I'm a LeBron fan. I'm a Yankee fan. I'm a, you know, I'm a Cowboy fan. I'm a Duke fan. I'm a, you know, as soon as they're not that good, I'm not that interested. But as soon as I am, I'm going to be the loudest asshole in the room, the loudest one in the bar, the one who's looking for fights at the game. 49er fan, I've never really seen any bad interaction with them. I, you know, they are... They're a very huge fan base. You see these away games. They're all over the place everywhere. Um, no, um, I will – they will come out of the woodwork only now. Uh, they are not nearly as obnoxious as Cowboy fans or as stupid. And you're right. Around here, the Cowboy fan is the f- current front runner fan. So he's currently oh, like yeah. a Laker fan. You know what I mean? That That's like a whole other thing. That's a whole subsect of Cowboys fans. Yeah. Um, but – the other thing is, you know, Niners fans are, are absolutely insane scumbags. Also, uh, in 2011, if you remember, the FBI had to go to a game because the game before in the playoffs, uh, yeah. there was an assault that happened in the parking lot, something like that. So, you know, whatever. I, 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 I've, that happens everywhere. That's I guess so. But there's, the there's still, in my opinion, the, the kind of people that come out of the woodwork around the, the United States whenever they're good because they were good 20, 30 – yeah, thirty I mean, there, years there, ago. There is there is Miami Dolphin, Oakland Raider. Yeah, I, I agree. Type also, of Pittsburgh um, Steeler thing where yeah. Except they they, they 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 never get to come out of the woodwork because Steelers get to Dolphins fans never get to come out of the woodwork ever. <laughs> um, so they, they they get to sip their champagne. They can live off of other people's failures, but not their own successes. Um, so you know, but but I, I I am rooting for San Francisco in this one. Anyway, I would never ever root for Kansas City again. Some petty reasons, you know. You do the Florida State chop, you're automatically dead to me. And you know, I'm sure a lot of Giant fans will be rooting against a a team that employs Kadarius Tony, even though he never plays. Although I will say it was great to see the fact that Odell Beckham is a complete non-factor uh, yet again in a big game. That was nice. Um, I did enjoy that. Without without going into actually knowing. 
contract situations. So I, because I, I don't want to make this that deep that we're looking this up or anything like that. But yeah, um, where do these four teams go from here next year? Because uh, a lot of times, a lot of chips have been put to the middle of the table to get here, and now we are down to two teams, and very soon. There will be only one team, and everyone will have to start from scratch again next year. But one team will have a trophy, and the other team, the other three teams, may be in a total mess situation. So, from your perspective, uh, from my perspective, just quickly looking at this, I think that all four of these teams are in an okay spot next year to rebound just fine. I want to know would, your thoughts, though. Yeah, I would. I would say that. I mean, there's. Yeah. yeah. I mean, all of them have quarterback situations that I don't have to worry about, right? Let's see. Lamar just signed. Um, Mahomes is signed long term. Purdy didn't have to worry about just yet. And uh, what's Goff's story? I don't know. But like I said, I don't want to get yeah. into. If I don't know, then I don't know. Well, I guess the Lions also seem like they're pretty young, too. I mean, they, they, they had a fantastic rookie class this year. Yeah. Um, they just seem like a pretty young team. They're not relying on a bunch of, you know, veterans and, and guy, rental guys or anything. So I, I think they're all in pretty good shape. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I think they're all in solid coaching situations as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, I I think that... Uh, yeah, and I, I think without knowing anything that's going on with Kansas City's situation, as long as Mahomes and Reed are stable, they're going to be just fine to build around going forward. Even if, like, 15 contracts are going away. It's interesting that you know they got rid of Eric Bieniemy as offensive coordinator, and they back in the Super Bowl again. When all the the accolades he got for being coordinator for so long, and you know why didn't he get a head coaching job? And, and he moves on, and they're right back where they are. Well, actually, let's discuss one thing here because you mentioned that. Um, mm-hmm. Will the Lions be able to bounce back from the fact that their offensive coordinator is most likely leaving? That's a big deal because, in my opinion. Jared Goff is not that talented, and this is an offense that has certainly gotten the most out of it. It, it has taken all of the things that he does very, very well and built an offense around it. I'll say it that way. And mm-hmm. I think that that is going to be a difficult thing to replicate. So, your thoughts? That could be. I mean, we saw what happened to Philly when you lose your, your offensive coordinator, but you think these coordinators seem to be – you know, a flavor of the month, one month, minute, and they're gone the next minute anyway. So, um, and also the, the, the problem is when you are losing coaches this late in the cycle, when you become a Super Bowl team or, you know, a conference championship team, a lot of the other choices you have to replace it have gotten other jobs already. Like, think about, it, you know, when, when we started this, there were what, nine head coaching jobs that were available. Now there's one or two left. I mean, the same thing with coordinators. You see coordinators being hired every day. Um, guys, and so their pick of who they want to get is, you know, their th- that uh, you know available list is, is a lot more uh, lower than it would have been, you know, if they would have had like a Black Monday firing and you know had to choose back then. Yeah, it certainly makes it harder. Uh, I'm not really sure who is left out there. Um, I've been focusing on other shit, right, but right. but I think they're the only ones that are probably going to lose anyone major. I believe. Uh, I think just position coaches for all the other teams. Uh, 49ers, uh defensive coach might. He's only been there one year, though, right? I don't. Yeah, I, is he even getting interviews? I think he might have had an interview, maybe. Okay. But it seems like the 49ers have gone through so many coordinators in the past. You know. Yeah ever since Shanahan's been here. So it's amazing. Another thing, it's a, a, a pretty amazing, you know, the, between the Patriots during their run and, you know, this 49er run of being really good, that they just cycle through coordinators and position coaches and, you know, the organization just stays where they are. Um, I'm, I'm glad that all four of these teams look like they're going to be in, in a good spot. I, I'm hoping for Detroit. They might be a little rocky. We'll see. Um, but yeah, uh, flipping over to Giants news. Oh, remember them? <laughs> yeah. New York Giants hired a special teams coordinator finally. It, he was formerly the assistant special teams coordinator for the New York Jets for three years. Prior to that, he was a special teams coordinator in, among multiple college ranks. Um, I, I, I don't have a strong opinion about this. I like, I guess, that they went 
with an up and coming guy. I think that that's going to be kind of interesting, right? I mean, the most important thing for me with this is not necessarily who they hired, but the fact that they needed to address it and they they fired what's his name right at the, the one. Of the, Correct. Yeah. That initial, Same. That's that's the biggest thing to me. It's like we have to do something. We 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 have identified that there's a problem, and even before the whole thing went on with uh, the defensive coordinator, all that drama. He was fired immediately. So, bring the up and comer in. You know, this again. We're it's just not like we're bringing in a head coach. It's not like we're bringing in general managers, a special teams guy. Um, you know, more attention to it. A, a different set of attention. Different pair of eyes. To you know, to to work with special teams and you know, a special teams coordinator doesn't kick field goals or kick extra points, but the attention to detail which has definitely been lacking on this team for a long time. Just a different approach to it should help with that. Yeah, it, it, it certainly seems like a, a special teams unit that was just not prepared. I mean, we were we were running like ten guys out in the field for the first couple games, if you remember. Oh, uh, yeah. There was like multiple times, and then like kind of just throwing players under the bus for it. Like, oh, you know these young guys. Like, you're a special teams coordinator. You always have young guys. That is always your job. You always have the 53rd man on your roster. Honestly, you have your 58th man on the roster. That's really the guys that you're working with. I don't want to hear these young guys need to get it. You're the coordinator. How yeah. dare you with that? Um, you know, Grump, I I lived the parallel lives with the Giants and the Gators, and the and the Gators also fired. They didn't have a special teams coordinator. They had like a kind of a group of coaches, and the same things were going on. Lack of detail. You know, almost once a game, having ten men on the field during a a punt or an extra point because nobody's, you know, no attention to detail. So I'm glad that both teams are finally making it a priority that, you know, it's a it's not one third of the game, but it's an important part of the game. And it can be on the margins, make a difference between a win or a loss in any given week. So, yeah, the the one third of the game thing, it's they are very potent. They're they're very high percentage turnover plays, which makes them extremely Mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. The few plays that they are. The bare minimum of playing disciplined is the most important thing. Uh, so yeah, I, I agree with you. The most important well, so thing—it's so high profile because it's either a turnover or a penalty, which is like flag, stop everything. But when special teams just go, you know, right? I'm just gonna I'm gonna punt it 43 yards. I'm gonna catch it and return it five yards, and that's it. That should be. That's like not noticing the umpire in baseball until he screws up like it's just right. it just happened and we move on correct yeah the, lead, the rules have changed in special teams it's so much harder to have a, a kickoff return for a touchdown or a punt return or get an onside kick or anything that just to execute it properly and let's move on with the game don't make it a negative yeah and i i couldn't agree with you more that just addressing the problem of getting rid of you know McGahey and and getting somebody new in here, I I think that that's mm-hmm. that was the big thing. Yeah. The, the Giants struggled to fill that position. They are currently struggling to fill their defensive coordinator position. They've been blocked interviews, and there's kind of this rumor going around that the Giants organization is a place to avoid at least right now, a, a place that is lacking in some kind of structure or. Uh, stability, I guess. Uh, and I guess I, I I just kind of I feel like when I read that it was like well, even as a fan I feel that way. So people who work with these people and know people and, you know, text each other I'm sure they know more than I do. That doesn't surprise me. But it's, I will say that it's disheartening because we have always been known as a uh, sturdy foundation of the league, but uh, I don't know. What do you think? Well, I, I guess I have a lot of different thoughts about this, actually. I mean, if we're talking over the past, you know, decade, yeah. I mean, we've had four coaches in 10 years. We've had two different general managers. We've had a slew of offensive and defensive coordinators coming in. Um, but right now, Oh, you know, I think ever since we've had this new administration, I think it depends on who these people are spreading these kind of words of wisdom. If it's someone like Bill Belichick telling people, 
I'd like to know how he knows, considering you know the last time he was really involved intimately with the inner workings of the Giants organization. You know, we're talking seven or eight head coaches, a different owner, basically. I mean, he this he was a Wellington Mara guy. Um, you know, I, who knows what what does he really know? What's well, the inner hang workings on. of all thirty two teams? Let's let, let me ask you this: Is it yeah? Is it fair to say? If you go back to the Wellington Mara era, to the John Mara era, is that not – if you want to just compare those two things, could you not say that just the entire John Mara era has been a slow downward spiral? Sure. You could say that. that I, I, that's a fair statement. Um, but again, now we're talking about you know we're going into year three of a general manager and a head coach, right? We, you know, what the, the, the words you're hearing, you know, if you're going to hear from Wink Martindale with his take on it, it might be a different take on it than, you know, someone else who's been involved in the organization. You know, a, a disgruntled ex-employee is probably not going to have nice things to say. So if like Joe Judge went back to Bill Belichick and said, you know, boy, the Giants are a mess. Well, sure, he's going to say that. I mean, he lasted two years and got fired. For you know whatever the reason you want to say why he was fired, so I don't know. Um, there was also mention of how Bill Belichick was involved in the Brian Flores Brian Dable mix up. Um, mm-hmm. I I guess I I'm trying to play devil's advocate. It is possible that John Mara uh, stinks at doing this sure. and that. He has a bad reputation, and it is possible that John Mara screwed something up with Brian Flores and Brian Dable, and communication and stuff like that. We we don't really know what the hell happened with all of that. Let me ask you a question: When did the really the handover to John Mara happen? When was like the the approximate? Was that was that before the two Super Bowl wins, or it was before the two Super Bowl wins? Yeah, right? I think the it was like either the year that they won. Or maybe just like a couple years prior to the 2007 one. Even if it's close around there too, you know, something was going on right with that organization that we won, you know, two Super Bowls in in, in four years. So it's not like all of a sudden we got Al Davis, you know, running the team into the ground. I think if you're being completely objective, they have – they were only – they – their height was 2008, and they've only been getting worse since 2008. So if yeah. you take over in 2005, and then your height is 2008, and you're on a downward slope ever since then, I don't know that you can really take credit for in, instead of maybe your predecessor. You know what I mean? It's yeah. kind of like presidential graphs where like they always point to like economic, you know, like the first like month of a president's office, and be like, oh look, the economy is garbage. It's like, he hasn't even right. like appointed half of his cabinet yet. You know what I mean? Like, it's kind of like I, that. I think all the drama we had with Dable and Wink and maybe Kafka and stuff. I think that's not helping the situation at all. But is it really? I agree. Because, yeah. But is it really because the organization is a hot mess, or is it just well, I a mean, personality I, conflict here and there? I mean, that, that, that's a big range. But what's the perception being thrown out there? My thought process is – I don't really know what the perception is. My thought process is that John Mara was always taught to be like a – you know, treat this organization like a family and be more of a hands-off guy as much as you can. And I think that he was a hands-off guy for much of the beginning here. Um, and I think that he trusted his people and they ran it into the ground. And then he started to get involved to try and right the ship and he has since – been involved trying to right the ship because it's never been fixed it hasn't been fixed since coughlin and jerry reese like that that regime when that regime disbanded there has not been a fix and so he has probably been more involved in these past couple of years than he was initially and if you want to say you know, if you, if you want to look at the big picture of ever since John Mayer got here, it's been a downward spiral. They haven't really been doing anything right. And then in the last 10 years, the more he's gotten involved, the more chaotic it's been over there. Coaches in and out. Now you've got this Wink Martindale situation. And one other thing on that Wink situation, just one other thought that I had on it is, remember, 
it was hypothesized or rumored that Wink was kind of like a Mara guy, that Mara favored Wink. And it's a possibility that Mara's hooks, you know, made that situation worse than it needed to be. We'll, we'll never, ever, ever know the kind of things that, you know, happened in there and that are probably being leaked around the league and, and shared, rumored as, as doors are, you know, people pack things into cardboard boxes and stuff like that. Uh, but these are just potential things I'm thinking of. But just as a fan, like, yeah, I would say this organization's been a fucking mess since 2008. I think as a fan, we sure. can see that. So, like, making it into a gigantic story, I think, is somewhat salacious. Uh, that's not the right word. I don't know. You're just kind of piling on a little bit. It, it's it's easy to do now. It's an easy. It's an easy. It's an easy. It's like hit. embellished. Yeah. It's an easy thing for the fan to talk about as a talking point. It's easy to put on the, you know, as a story in the back of the New York Post. It's like, yeah, well, um, but you know, again, remember there are only 32 teams in this league, and there are only 32 head coaching spots, and there's only 64 coordinator jobs in this league. So, you know, you know, it. it Saying like this is not the job, this is not a good one or something. It's still there's a limited amount of jobs there are available. So, you know, I I I take what these guys say with a little bit of grain of salt, and I think also I think these, you know, candidates are also taking with a grain of salt too, because you know, you know, a guy like Bill Belichick might say, you know, this that that might be a mess, but at the end of the day, there's not that that many jobs out there to go for, and I think at the end of the day, if they want these jobs, they'll they'll apply for them and. You know. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, that's kind of going to do it for this episode. Um, I am flying to Mobile, Alabama tomorrow morning, yeah. tomorrow afternoon. When I will land there late, I will be joining the Talking Giants guys, Bobby and Justin. Um, whatever episode they do Monday, I believe I'll be arriving too late to join, but I'll be there for all three practices, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. I'm excited get to see some quarterbacks some really good candidates this is gonna yeah, be yeah so what exactly are you what are you most interested in like looking is there have you identified anybody you really want to look at right now or is it a little too early or do you when you go to this do you have like an open mind like i'm just gonna go see and oh this guy jumps out at me i'm gonna you know i I, mean, I, 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 I didn't even look at the rosters yet so i don't i don't have any idea the only thing that i know is that michael Penix and bo Nix are going to be there and they're going to be on the same team so i get to see them take reps oh, back okay. to back so that's something i'm for sure going to keep an eye on especially from a giants perspective and speaking of those two guys i did on my football grump channel just put out a video i looked over the six major quarterbacks um coming out in this draft class and compared and contrast them there are things to like about all six there are things to dislike about all six um i think it's an interesting watch because i found my my perception of what I had heard from people and from fans and whatever was not what I was expecting to actually see. Mm. Um, so some things were a little bit different than what I expected. All right. I'm looking forward. And we're going to, uh, just for a schedule thing, we're going to try to see if we can get you guys on our feed for a show later this week, if, if time permits. Or Yeah, I, I haven't spoken to them on any of our um, itinerary stuff yet, but... Yeah. Okay, because I, I know in the past, like, you guys are just, like, live, you know, BSing one night. I, I've called in a couple times when we've been on there and stuff. I know, I think last year, we did a show on our feed, you know, kind of reviewing things. So, you know. Yeah. It, it, what I would say, just basically, just follow our Twitter feeds, you know, follow this feed and, you know, and also follow Talking Giants, too. And you will find some combination of the four of us, you know all week um, me probably a lot less than the other three but uh you know we'll, we'll, we'll try to get everybody on together so we can you know go over what you like you didn't like what you're interested in following up and all those fun things yeah um i i think we're, we're gonna try and get an episode in um i just i have no idea because i haven't spoken to them about the itinerary okay. and our our situation is slightly different this year we're not staying in the same hotel so oh. i i uh i just don't know anything in order to say anything yet so but, okay. but but I'm excited. This is always my favorite time of year. This is always a really good time to find someone that I hadn't thought of before that catches this, my eye. 
And to be very honest, everybody, I think this is where the grump really shines the most. I mean, this is something that I, you know, I think you have the most passion on and I think you do. It's amazing the work that you do and the, uh, you know, the level of detail you do and your reviews, because I'll take that up with the Pepsi challenge with any of these guys on ESPN or, or rivals or anything for draft evaluation. Cause I think it's, it's very smart. It's very nuanced. It's, I learn a lot from it. Um, I am not the biggest uh, draft guy. You, know, you are much more than me, but I learn a lot. I know what to look for. So, um, and I think you are uh, the way you work with, uh, with Bobby and Justin is, is great. So I I'm looking forward to all the coverage as, as a fan, as much as a, you know, a show guy with you also. So, yeah. And, and this is fun because this is a place where lots of people can kind of bounce ideas off of each other and look at film together and, and just kind of give each other pointers. So this is always a really fun time for me. Um, yeah. So yeah, check that out on Talking Giants. I will be there. Um, hopefully they will be here. And if not, we will be back on Tuesday morning, I guess. We will have probably either any, any news updates and... Um, a senior bowl recap will next do. next tuesday's episode right okay, correct gotcha. yeah yeah sure. uh and until then go giants go giants